A very good evening to all our viewers and uh, welcome to this week's edition of The Agenda. My name is uh, Toivon Jabela, your host. Tonight on the show we are joined by Mulima Mushokabanji, or Mushokabanji rather. He is uh, the CEO of Midco and he is here to talk about, of course, the company and uh, the business and everything related thereto. Uh, Conway CEO, uh, what a pleasure to have you here. So thank you for making time. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and uh, good evening to all Namibians. Wonderful. I think um, uh, we can start with this conversation with uh, the space in which you operate. Uh, people see meat coal as, um, as a, a mere meat production or manufacturing company, but uh, there's so many related uh, areas in that space that you operate in. If you can give me a sense of, um, if you can locate for me within that sector, agriculture, uh, manufacturing, just if you can locate for me the company within that space. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Look, um, I think it's important to stipulate that um, agriculture remains um, the backbone of the Namibian economy. Yeah. Um, if you look at the current trades, trends that are prevailing globally, you'd actually see that um, the current uh, global population is at 7.5 billion. Mm. Uh, by 2050, we could have marched to, to around 10.5 billion. Mm. Now, um, evidence exhibits that um, the extra 2.5 billion mouth to feed, there will be residents of mostly the developing world, including emerging markets such mm. as Asia and Africa. Mm. Um, so, agriculture uh, remains critical because now from the context of food and nutritional security, you need to prepare yourself to be able to look after uh, this growing population. And I think that is the key role of agriculture moving forward into the future. Mm. Uh, we have got the sustainable development goals. Key there, you would see that some of the goals, they are very clear. We need to make sure that we, we alleviate poverty all over, the, all over the world. Mm. We need to attain food and nutritional security. So agriculture is very critical. Yeah. If you look at the Agenda 2063 of the African Union, actually we were much more clear there. If you look at that whole agenda, agriculture is brought out. Yeah. And that's how come the African leaders were very clear because they recognize the importance of agriculture. We have got what we call uh, the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program, mm -hmm. CADAP. Mm -hmm. Now, that whole program was actually, if you look at it, is aimed at making sure that how do we boost agricultural primary production mm -hmm. uh, on the continent? And how do we make sure that after boosting this agriculture, I mean, boosting primary production, how do we set up the infrastructure, the soft and the hardcore infrastructure to make sure that we are able to agro process mm. what we produce so that the continent got a turnaround strategy from being an exporter of raw materials yeah. to being an exporter of value added products. Within a cut up, you would actually see we are very clear in saying that we want to intensify intra-Africa trade. Mm. So we are very clear on that and we have, we, we have, we have cascaded that down to the regional agricultural policy that is being operationalized by SADIC. And mm -hmm. ultimately, as a country, you would see that we are very clear in our uh, agricultural policy as a country where we are focusing more on the growth at home as the strategy. So MITCO as a commercial public enterprise, mm -hmm. driving agro-processing in the meat industry becomes a catalyst of that particular change. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, CEO, when you say, uh, when you described uh, MITCO as a public enterprise, <laughs> because there are always questions around the ownership model of, of the company. Who owns uh, Midco? Yeah, you see, if you look at the metamorphosis of Midco, uh, you have got uh, the Midco before in, in parents when it was still, uh, you know, called Swamet. Yeah. Uh, as a result, with time, uh, just like anywhere else, uh, after independence, there were so many developments in our institutional arrangements, mm. uh, in our legislation space, milieu, that actually took place. And that also, uh, you know, brought about changes that you have seen around MITCO. So MITCO is established by an act of parliament, the Meat Company Act, mm. uh, where we extract our matching orders in terms of what we operationalized. And within the act, clear, uh, we have the objects there that actually authorize, uh, authorizes us to make sure that we develop market, we, st we stabilize the meat industry. Mm. Uh, with time, the Public Enterprise Governance Act was actually introduced in 2015. Within the uh, government actually classified uh, which 
commercial institutions would, for example, be regulating, which one would be commercial public enterprises, and MITCO was listed as a commercial public enterprises. So from where we are sitting is, yeah. MITCO is listed as a government entity mm -hmm. that is there to stabilize market failures mm -hmm. where there are challenges. So MITCO belongs to government, and the government is the shareholder, and that's the reason why when there were challenges and the government yeah. stepped in because that's basically the, the main key parent. Mm -hmm. Where is the, there was, there's always a very strong community element to the MITCO model where you sort of, you know, the farmers, communities, and um, for, you know, th there are always these sentiments within those communities that no, this is a, a, a farmer's entity, a, some even hinting strongly that uh, government shouldn't be anywhere close to the organization. Um, uh, how do you, what do you say to those? Yes, uh, MITCO is a, a creature of statutes. Yeah. Uh, we are in a constitutional democracy and rule of law is paramount. Yeah. So um, as administrators of the organization, we are guided by the law. And yeah. as it is right now, what we say is, uh, among so many other laws, uh, paramount the Namibian constitution, but those that impact MITCO is the Mid Company Act, the Public yeah. Enterprise uh, uh, Governance Act that mm -hmm. regulates uh, the affairs of MITCO. So the current Namibian laws classifies MITCO as a commercial public enterprise and it's operating as such. So it's a creature of statutes and, statutes, and those statutes uh, regulate. Uh, we extract yeah. our matching orders from there and what we do on a daily basis in terms of operationalizing our strategy. Mm -hmm. So related to that, and I don't want to labor the point, but I think it's important that to you, you unpack it for me and my viewers. Um, the, the, I think, was it 2021, there were these headlines about some members or I don't want to call, I don't know how to really affiliate them to MITCO wanting to detach themselves to the company and create a parallel uh, institution for meat, meat producers. Um, it, I mean, is it, um, uh, how, how do you handle that as, as leaders of the organization? Uh, I suppose first to make sure that you hang on to your members because they are very important to you. And also making sure that there's not um, too many breakaways from the organization. What, what is it that you do to sort of appease and make sure, appease your members or your, your, your suppliers of, of meat and whatnot, just to make sure that the institution remains intact and competitive? Yes, I think what is important um, at this stage of our nation and the agricultural sector, yeah. uh, when we reconfigured and they built uh, the current vision of MITCO where we said, we want to build a midco brand, yeah. a midco brand that would create sustainable wealth for all Namibians. Mm -hmm. For us, that is very, very important. And it's something that we have internalized and that we hold very high, mm -hmm. both the board and the midco employees. Yeah. We want to make sure that we build a midco with a brand that would go all over the world, mm -hmm. in Asia, in Europe, in the US, in the rest of Africa. Mm. And that brain should generate sustainable wealth for all Namibians. I want to unpack what this means. Yes. And as I unpack that, I'll be able to also be answering your question. Yes. Number one, what do we mean by creating sustainable wealth for all Namibians? We are basically saying we have now crafted one of the most competitive business models for Midco. Uh, in that business model, we were very clear in saying that the business model has to be competitive. That's very, very important. Mm -hmm. The business model has to be profitable and has to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we create wealth for all Namibians? Number one, we need to strive to make sure that we boost primary production. By that, I mean, we need to make sure that we have got the quantity and the quality of cattle mm -hmm. that comes to the abattoir. Mm -hmm. Because abattoir management is about nothing else. It's about the optimum throughput. Mm -hmm. It's about making sure that you have got your, your operational efficiencies are in order and you are maximizing retains from the market. Mm. Now, as you maximize retain from the market, you are basically generating foreign exchange earnings back into the country. If I can operationalize to address this particular question, is I'll give you an example of 2019-2020, where we had a drought. Yes. We slaughtered 116,000 cattle. Mm. Our revenue was 1.7 billion. Out of the 1.7 billion, we paid 1.1 billion to the producers. Mm. 
On top of that, we created employment. And actually, when you look at the contribution of the livestock industry, yeah. the meat industry in that particular year, 50% of the contribution came from Midco. So key in our strategy is to make sure that ultimately we need to make sure that we maximize value to all Namibians. Mm -hmm. If we can generate revenue and contribute to GDP and create employment, we will be delivering on the KPIs of government because that's what is government's expectation. Mm. If, like we are doing now, we can pay a competitive price to the producers to maximize retain at primary production, yeah. then it will be more sustainable. Because the more we keep farmers, producers into business, yeah. the more Mitko is competitive because we are able to have volumes into the abattoir. That's very important. So, mm. to come to your question, what do we do with the different interest groups we have? Yes. What, for example, you have got uh, um, commercial farmers in yeah. the country. Yeah. You have got the emerging farmers in the country. Yeah. You have got communal farmers south in the country. Then you have got the northern of the communal area. Now, in our strategic intent, we were very clear when we did a stakeholder analysis. We yeah. said, you have government. Generate revenue, contribute GDP, create employment. You could have met the key KPIs mm -hmm. for government. Mm -hmm. Now, then we have got farmers south of the veterinary cordon fence. Now, you know that this is the free zone. You don't have FMD outbreak. Uh, we are threatened now because of the outbreaks in South Africa and Botswana. Mm. Now, this part of the country, south of the VCF, we could export in some of the luxury markets, which is China, uh, the US, including the rest of Europe. So mm. it became easier for Mutco to maximize retain for only farmers from the south of the VCF. Yeah. Now, naturally, because Mutco is a commercial public enterprise, in the act, you have got both a public policy objective you also have a commercial objective. So a public policy objective basically says Mitko should save all producers within and outside the territory. Yeah. So that says that you need to save all Namibian producers regardless of where they are who want to sell to Mitko. Mm. Because Mitko is there to stimulate production, to stimulate farmers to remain in production. Mm. So now, we had a situation whereby the northern of the communal area are basically excluded from the mainstay of the economy because Mitko did not have abattoir. Mm. So the concerns came from the northern of the communal area to say we need to be included. So we received a government directive from cabinet to say Mitko operate the Katima Miro abattoir, operate Rundu abattoir, and provide the Kinko support to the Oshakati abattoir. So what we did as Mitko in a strategic intent, we said, look, we are not a charity organization. We have got a commercial mandate. Mm. So what we did first was to say, let us first operationalize the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. Mm. Let's first get markets for the beef from the northern of the communal area. Yeah. So immediately we went to West Africa because in our research we picked up that actually countries like Ghana are more lucrative, are more luxurious. Uh, they would want they, their populations are very high with better currencies than the rest of West Africa. Yeah. So after engagements, we did not delay within a period of. Uh, uh, two years, we were able to export containers of beef into Ghana. So we have penetrated the market. Mm. We are busy expanding our footprints. Mm. Currently, as I'm talking to you, meat from Katima and Rundu yeah. and Oshakati can actually now move over into Angola. We have sent containers into Angola. Yeah. We are now at an advanced stage engaging the Middle East to make sure we also export the Middle East. Mm. Now, the reason why I'm explaining this to, to the country and to everybody else is yeah. You can only respond to meet the different concerns from different interest groups mm. if you are able to treat them equal by making sure that you max retain to all the farmers. Mm. So as soon as we were able to open up abattoirs in the northern of the communal area, that particular segment of the society, at least it was a little bit satisfied. The problem we have now is the disparities in the price. That still remains yeah. a concern yeah. and we'll be addressing that. Now, in your question, you were saying, there were some groups that wanted to deviate from Mitko uh, and set up something else. You look, we live in a democracy today. Our responsibility is to build a commercially, dynamically capable commercial public enterprise that is agile, that is resilient, that is, competent, that is competent, competitive, and that is profitable. That's mm. our responsibility that should look after the Namibian economy, yeah. and that keeps us busy. Now, if there are Namibians that would want to set up uh, similar institutions. I mean, we have got 2.5 million heads of cattle in the country. 64% mm. of that is in the, in the northern, of, northern communal areas. I mean, in the northern of the communal areas. We have had many abattoirs in the past. Mm. We strongly believe we can coexist. Mm. Uh, competition is very healthier. 
uh, we have got sufficient markets and uh, we should be able to do business equally. Mm, mm, mm. You, you spoke, uh, CEO, before we go on a, uh, a break, uh, you spoke about the Africa continental free trade uh, area. Uh, I mean, that agreement, Namibia has ratified it. Um, I see the movement. I think you recently uh, opened up in Ghana. You alluded to it briefly. Um, I think mm. DRC, there's also an element yes, of yes, DRC yes, there. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you spoke of Angola. Um, wh what is the end goal? Wh what is it that uh, will make you happy as an institution to say we are now fully exploiting this, uh, this trade agreement? The end goal, agriculture got two fundamental developmental objectives yeah. at any point in the lifetime of a nation. Yeah. Number one is to drive what we call agriculture for development. Yeah. And ultimately, what you want to achieve is to make sure you are achieving food and nutritional security. Mm -hmm. So the end goal is to make sure that we have got a Namibia that is self-reliant in terms of food security, whereby we should be able to produce what we eat, all of us as a country. Yeah. The second goal, which really answers your question, is commercial, is business, mm -hmm. it's agripreneurship. Mm -hmm. So what we want to achieve, ultimately, long term, is to make sure that we create sustainable wealth for all Namibians mm. so that we stimulate primary production mm. by giving our producers the most competitive price at any time and pay them timely mm. so that they are able to remain in business. Because if Mitko can pay producers the best price at all time, mm. then producers will be able to find reasons why they should remain in production. So ultimately, our quest as Medco is to make sure that we continue developing markets, yeah. diversifying our markets like we have done in the past two, three years. We were in the past our traditional markets was only Europe. Yes. I'm glad today that through the help of government and thank you so much to government as a stakeholder, we have developed now the Chinese market. Remember, as Namibians, we should not take these opportunities for granted. Yeah. We are the only country currently that got dynamic capabilities because of our animal welfare system and traceability system we have in the country that can export in some of the most strictest mm. markets china europe and the usa yeah no any other african country can export into those areas and the reason why we can is because we have got most of the function institutions that we have set up mm. so critical to us is to continue developing these markets and that's the reason why as midco we championed to basically develop further markets mm. within africa to operationalize intra-africa trade and we are happy for example angola the vice president of angola came to midco he said Angola spends nine billion US dollars per annum exporting exporting beef from Brazil and other European countries. Mm -hmm. But uh, Angola is actually saying, you know what, we want to import meat from Namibia, our neighboring country. Yeah. And that's the bigger picture that we want to see. So a meat industry that is competitive, that is profitable, that is sustainable, that generates wealth for all Namibians and that mm. will give Namibians a reason to find agriculture luxurious, especially yeah. the youth and women. Yeah. We need to make sure we digitalize agriculture. We need to make agriculture sexy. Absolutely. I want to see young people in this country. I want to see yeah. young people in this country admiring to become producers and yeah. to become farmers. Absolutely. We go for a quick break and return uh, with uh, Mr. Musoko Banji. In Business 7, you get news on current economic, financial and business matters in Namibia. The weekly show features interviews with experts and in-depth analysis of burning issues in a way that caters for ordinary Namibians and business connoisseurs alike. For news related or advertising queries, please contact b7 at synergy.com.na. Namibia's hospitality is as vibrant as its people. Join the Watts Cooking team as they travel the country cooking, chatting, and celebrating local personalities and the joy of food. If you think you have a standout offering, whether it's a restaurant, bar, pop-up event, or bride stand, get in touch with the What's Cooking team at cooking at synergy.com.na and we will be there to show the world what's cooking. 
programs air every Friday at 4 p.m. on all the NMH Facebook platforms, as well as on NTV, DSTV Channel 285, and Go TV Channel 94 at 9 p.m. <clears throat> we continue our conversation on the agenda. Now, CEO, um, where do you export your meat to? I mean, of course, you, we spoke briefly about the African markets now, um, but you, you touched on the USA, China, um, which is sort of your, your key market right now. Uh, is it Europe still? Yeah, so currently we export into Europe uh, and China. We can export into the US. Yeah. Uh, we are busy uh, reconfiguring our uh, upstream to make sure that we can beef up the numbers of containers into those countries. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we export into Angola, we export into Ghana. Uh, like I said, we are at the advanced stage now to look at how we can penetrate the Middle East. It's critical to diversify the markets so that mm. Uh, for example, what we experienced during the COVID outbreak, yeah. uh, uh, it was China, Europe and the US that were hit the most. Yeah. So when restaurants and shops were closed, at one point we did not have a place to sell. Mm. So we survived because we had diversified our markets. So when we could not sell in China, we could still sell in Europe. So those are the markets where we are currently uh, selling our products. Yeah. And, and, and locally, how, how much does the local market, how much percentage of your overall production does the local market take? Look, we were not so much active in the local markets uh, in the past uh, 10 years or so. Uh, we developed a strategy, especially with the NCA beef. Uh, mm -hmm. After we operationalized commodity-based trade, that beef from the NCA can now move to the south. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we only began doing that this year. Uh, I think we'll, we'll be at a much more better place by the end of this year to see how much we are supplying to the local markets. But mm -hmm. we want to see if at least... 10% uh, of what we produce can be consumed locally. Uh, yeah. that, that would be great. Absolutely. Uh, because I, I suppose it can also uh, make meat a bit cheaper. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, now, CEO, this issue of, uh, you, you spoke of the veterinary cord on fence, um, which is something that is outside your control as an institution. It's authorities who must, uh, who are actually the custodian of that fence. But I'm curious as to how does it affect you as a business? Because you spoke about, uh, if I if I heard you correctly, about 65% or so of of uh, cattle being on the other side of the fence, um, and. Uh, having obviously opened up those abattoirs now uh, north of the fence or east of the fence, if it's in the case of Katima and Rundu, does it have any impact on your, on your business model or your, your, your operations? If it wasn't there, would Midco do better or worse? Yes, look, uh, the veterinary cordon fence definitely does have an impact on the performance of Namibia's meat industry as a whole. Yeah. Uh, if we had a free zone across the country, and what I mean by that is that uh, if Namibia was declared a free zone as a country, so naturally that would mean we can export our beef into China, into Europe, into the USA. Yeah. So uh, number one, we would not struggle in terms of volumes. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, you would see that 2019-2020, we slaughtered 116,000 cattle. Why did we do so? It was because it was a year of drought. Farmers wanted to make sure that they did stock. Mm. But 2020-2021, uh, because the drought basically halved 50% of the national head yeah. from 2.5 million heads of cattle that we have. Mm. So the 2020-2021, basically, we only slaughtered 36,000 cattle from 116,000. And in order to operate the Midco Abattoir yeah. competitively, yeah. profitably and sustainably, you at least need 60 to 70,000 cattle to break even. Mm. So when you are slaughtering 35,000 cattle, you basically don't have a business. Yeah. So for the past two years, it has really been very rough for the business. Now, if you did not have the veterinary of the cordon fence, 
we could have utilized the northern of the coast because when we had the drought here yes the nca were hit by the drought but the cattle numbers were still very high mm -hmm. so it affects midco as an institution not to have access to high volumes that we do have access and ultimately yeah. access these volumes slaughter package and be able to export because look the more you export value-added products out of a country the more it empowers you to generate foreign exchange earnings mm. it also impacts uh, the trade balance of the country it's not good to uh, export less than you import you are better off when you export more and basically import less that way you end up having a positive trade balance as a country mm. so if the nca was a free zone the rest of the country our revenue would increase mm -hmm. our ability to generate foreign exchange earnings create employment for the country would also in increase mm -hmm. so they are bottlenecks because of the veterinary cordon fence but i'm glad that we do have interventions to deal with that mm -hmm. just <coughs> just in practical terms uh, mm -hmm. ceo the where do you derive most your most value in terms of income from M meat exported from the south of the fence and meat from uh, north of the fence. I'm asking because one of the complaints by farmers in the north is mm -hmm. that uh, they are denied the lucrative markets that their southern counterparts have. So I'm trying to see if even, uh, I mean, if I'm selling, if I'm a northern based farmer selling my meat to Angola and then a guy from Otavi sells his to Norway, whether uh, who, who is earning more there? Yeah, so you see, uh, maxing return is influenced by uh, the business volatility yeah. globally and what happens in the market. Mm. For example, um, a fillet would not realize the same in Ghana, would not realize the same in France or the same in Germany or the same in Norway. Mm. So it will be different. The most luxury markets currently, lucrative market that we have is Norway. Mm. And hence we have got the Norwegian quota where Namibia is given that 1,600 tonnage uh, and then the other 1.6 is basically given to Botswana. Mm. So to answer your question, uh, currently beef from the northern of the communal areas, remember in the past it could not be even be brought from the NCA to the south. Yeah. So by operationalizing commodity based, which we, are, we have done now, beef from the northern of the communal area is now consumed all over Namibia. And it's important for the viewers to know that, mm. that beef from the NCA can now move to the south. And we are moving it by following a nine step protocol that is approved by the competent authority, which is our Directorate of Veterinary Services. It's called Commodity Based Trade that we are operationalizing. Mm. So now you would see that beef from the NCA currently, we can only sell it here in the south and then in, uh, Angola and then Ghana. And we are still developing other markets. So the more you are able to take this beef in lucrative markets and you realize more, the more you are also able to basically pay your producers better. Mm. And this is where the disparities comes in. Mm -hmm. Um, how much are we exhausting the Norwegian quota? Um, <clears throat> I'm asking because in the past there used to be a vet flay about to yes, yes, yes. and uh, and a medical both having uh, that quota to fill. Uh, I just wonder now that uh, vet flay meat doesn't exist anymore. Whether medical is able to fill that that quota, or you can actually still export more. Yes, no, uh, we have been filling up the quota. Even currently now, we have actually already filled up the quota. So um, for the past 10 years or so, Mitko had never had problems yeah. with actually filling up. Because normally, like currently, Mitko is given 75% yeah. of the quota, which is 1,200 tonnage, and we have already filled it up. So uh, that has never really been an issue at all. Mm. Now, you were asking what are some of the most performing markets. Uh, yes. Markets change depending yeah. on what is happening. Mm. Uh, Norway has always remained a more luxury market. But recently, uh, with the, the current conflict we are experiencing uh, in Europe, we have seen a rise in commodity prices mm. such that some of the countries are becoming more competitive uh, they are trying to actually match uh, Norway, 
But also, we are seeing uh, that the future lies in China. Yeah. I mean, uh, the rest of Asia, you are talking about 4 billion people. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, as China rises in emerging as an economic power, uh, they have the population, they have the purchasing power. So uh, strategic, our strategic foresight is actually, uh, we are trying to make sure that we uh, expand our footprint mm. uh, in, in China and in mainland uh, Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I wanted to engage you on China because uh, there was this uh, big hype about a Namibian container some years ago en route to, to China. Yeah. But since then, I haven't really been able to trace the frequency of this happening. Are, are, are we still exporting there? Yes, we are doing very well in China. We are exporting. Containers are moving every week. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the traffic is very high. Uh, yeah. We are doing extremely well, very well in terms of China. And we will continue making sure that we thrive to meet the import requirements yeah. for China to make sure that our food safety, our standards, our systems and processes, we should be able to make sure that we don't compromise our ability to meet the requirement of China as a country. It's of strategic nature. So we are doing very well on that. Okay. Mm. CEO, let's talk about um, the operations of, uh, of MIDCO. Um, in March 2022, when former public enterprises minister Leon Yuste was leaving, he said that uh, MIDCO is in huge trouble saying the current business model is not viable, including the fixed cost structure. Um, do, do you agree with him on, on, on that observation and what is being done to sort of rectify? Yes, so when he was making that statement at a time, um, number one, uh, as an industry, we had just experienced consecutive droughts yeah. up to 2019. As a result, 2019-2020, you lost 50% of your national head. Mm. So what was very clear was we had a tough path ahead of us. That's number one. Mm. Number two, uh, after losing the raw material that you need to function and to be competitive as Midco, uh, you also had COVID-19. Yeah. So upstream of the value chain from the supply side, you did not have the raw material. Uh, and then he... Uh, from the demand side, you had problems. COVID erupts. Where does it erupt first? It hits China. Mm. It hits Europe and the US. These are your most luxury markets where you need to send your products. So your supply side is affected. You can't have the numbers of cattle that you need, mm. but also where you are selling the restaurants, the Horeca markets basically uh, has also closed. That's num number one. Mm. Number two was that uh, Midco's biggest challenge, which was so inherently, was a debt challenge. Midco's debt levels had moved up, you know, uh, to almost a billion. Uh, so as a result, when you operate a business in this particular environment, uh, to say Midco is in huge trouble, yeah. uh, that is very true. But we had to deal with that at a time. So what we have done, basically, I would want to report to you that if from a we had to develop a debt reduction strategy. Mm -hmm. So uh, the loan that was taken from Bank Venduk at the time in 2013 was uh, 94 million. Mm -hmm. uh, we have paid that off, so we have reduced the debt. And then uh, at a time we were owing FNB uh, 520 million, another huge debt. I'm glad to report to you that um, Government through a loan that they gave us paid the 120 million. The rest we paid it from our own coffers as Midco. Mm. So we have cleared those two dates. We still have a date with DBN, but of a reasonable amount. So we had to make sure together with the board to say, look, if we need to turn around Midco and move into the future, mm. we need to reduce that date. And we have drastically reduced that date. Mm. Uh, we are glad in terms of the drought that for the past two years, uh, farmers, they have restocked. Mm. Uh, it looks good. There's, you know, good number of ketu. Uh, it has been difficult. Uh, you could see uh, a drop in our revenue yeah. uh, from 1.7 billion 2019-2020 to basically around, you know, 800 million that mm. we had in 2020-2021-2020. In, mm. in this particular financial year, we are at around 700 million in terms of our revenue. So, when the ketu numbers decline, because the previous year the K2 numbers that we had was basically 
35,000 kedu. Mm. So your revenue is based around 700 million that you end up having. Mm. So as a result, the kedu numbers, the volumes, influences your revenue, your gross margin, and ultimately your net. Mm. So the past three years, the institution actually made losses because we did not have sufficient volumes that were coming into the abattoir. Mm. So to say Mitko is in big trouble under those climates at a time, uh, it was probably a relevant statement. But mm. uh, with the interventions we have put in place now, I think uh, we are casting our sight onto the future. Yeah. And uh, the fact that we have also addressed the market failures in the northern of the communal area, we can now export our products outside. Mm. Uh, these are signs that the institution is on the right path. Yeah. Now, before we go for the next break, uh, CEO again, <coughs> one of the challenges again, seem to be within legislation, the, the tools within the framework within which MITCO operates. Um, I understand, for example, that uh, the export levy that you guys have to pay is quite a huge amount, I think 30% or something like that. I, I was reading up a few things. Um, do, do you think there are some legislative and, you know, policy stumbling blocks towards or against the, 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 the really the path that you are on that you cannot spread your wings out properly as long as those uh, rules are in place? I think one thing that government has done very well over the years <coughs> was really to inculcate a conducive business environment, uh, especially for the meat industry. Yeah. Uh, the interventions that government has made, for example, we have the growth at home strategy in place that really encourages us to make sure that we turn around the meat industry from being a net exporter of raw materials Mm. to being a net exporter of value-added products. So I think in terms of uh, legislat legislative reviews, uh, regulations, putting in place policy interventions and giving MITCO the support, government has done uh, an extraordinary job and mm. we remain very appreciative. Actually, even the markets we are developing right now, mm. mostly it is the high commissioners and ambassadors abroad that are saving the country, that are actually promoting and driving that economic agenda objective. Mm. So I think in terms of that, there are challenges, but we are happy with the interventions that government has put in place. Yeah, wonderful. We go for another break and return for the last part of the show. With the focus on mind, body and soul, the medical focus aims to embrace that which makes us human, to empower, enlighten, and bring hope in restoring the equilibrium to be the best that we can be. To bring change where change is needed, to inspire to be better, and to restore that which is out of balance. Find the much anticipated medical focus, which will be published in the Republican, Namibian Sun, and Algemeine Zeitung, and the glossy magazines, which will be distributed to selected retail outlets, subscribers, and advertising partners. The Regional Review brings you news, views, and interviews from NMH correspondents from across the country. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact regional at synergy.com.na. The show continues. Um, CEO, I know that I'm putting you on the spot now here, but when you spoke about the nine points protocol of exporting, of moving meat from the northern side of the veterinary cordon fence to, to the south, if you can expand on that a little bit for me. I mean, uh, what does it involve? Yeah, so um, the Directorate of Veterinary Services, DVS, uh, they will be in a much more better position to basically unpack yeah. uh, this particular process. But in a nutshell, what we are saying is uh, the OIE, uh, together with the international organizations, they basically sat and looked at what is it that we can do in order to enable trade yeah. globally in the meat industry, especially for countries uh, that do experience FMD outbreaks. Mm. Now, a lot of research was done and it was actually found that uh, if you are able to follow a certain process, mm. 
even if you come from an infected zone where you have got FMD outbreak, yeah, yeah. if you slaughter uh, the cattle, you mature the beef, yeah. and you follow this particular process, yeah. your beef poses a much more lesser risk and it can be consumed anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. So there are countries in the world that basically recognizes commodity-based trade, this mm -hmm. particular process. So what you do is that when you are busy developing your markets, these are some of the arguments you put up close to say, we have got systems, we have yeah. got processes, we are operationalizing commodity-based trade, and this is where DVS as a competent authority basically gives the assurance mm. to the importing countries' competent authority to say this particular beef has went through CBT, and that's the reason why you would see that in all our abattoirs we have got veterinary doctors mm. that are basically providing assurance to the importing countries. Okay. Now I'm asking because there was... Um, our, our last edition of this show, we had uh, the King of Wandonga, and um, he, he was ob obviously not happy, or he is not very happy about the, uh, the existence of the red line and what he thinks is the denial of his community uh, access to, to, look, to, to lucrative markets. And he was saying one of the op two options that he suggested was to say that, you know, that, that um, you create quarantine facilities that side where for a period of time you keep your animals and after that you can then move them this side um, and I thought maybe within those nine pointers maybe uh, it would be sketched somewhere within that space um, I, I, I don't know but, 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 but I think you've clarified that and it's good actually that at least there's uh, some sort of relief in that regard. See, oh, what is the strategic importance of MITCO to the Namibian economy? Why, why should we fight very hard to make sure that the company continues to exist? Thank you so much. Uh, but look, MITCO is uh, a catalyst of change in steering economic development in the Namibian economy. Yeah. Uh, number one, uh, I its role is to stabilize uh, Namibia meat industry. It is there to make sure that it stabilizes. It stabilizes a sector that is so critical mm -hmm. to the Namibian economy. Uh, uh, key to that, really, key to that is Midco's ability to sustain primary production yeah. by uh, maximizing retains to the producers who are a key stakeholders because they supply cattle to Mitco. That's, that's very important. So Mitco uh, sustains food and nutritional security at household level. Mm. Mitco sustains livelihood by making sure that we max retains uh, from the market. But ultimately, these retains we are getting from the markets, we need to make sure that they cascade down to the farmer. And mm -hmm. the typical example I gave you, for example, in 2019-2020, where our total revenue was 1.7 billion, mm -hmm. but 1.1 billion, basically, we, we gave it back to the farmers to say, you were hit by the drought. Yeah. You use this money to make sure that you remain relevant, you remain resilient, so that we are able to move forward. Another critical issue is the fact that Midco is a, generate, or a generator of foreign exchange earnings. Mm -hmm. So we participate in making sure that we export and we generate revenue for the country, we contribute to GDP, we create employment in the Namibian economy. So mm -hmm. Midco is the, uh, paramount and the, of critical importance to the Namibian economy. Mm -hmm. And the, I would really want to you know, appreciate the support that we are getting from government, uh, from our stakeholders, the farmers uh, across the country, communal, mm. emerging and commercial, uh, the support we are getting from the Midco employees. We have got uh, uh, one of the most you know, enlightened, technically sound team at this stage at Midco, very experienced, mm. very energetic, very determined. And also uh, we have got a board that is really competent mm. and that is enabling and providing that oversight in terms of uh, governance leadership that we are getting from the board. I think those elements are very critical and we are appreciative to that. Mm. D do you receive the state subsidy? We don't receive a state uh, subsidy but uh, uh, I know that uh, 
before independence. At one point, government did give MITCO a loan. Uh, recently, uh, also government injected some capital, 200 million into MITCO. Uh, so uh, we do receive sufficient support from government. Yeah. Maybe then in conclusion, CEO, if you can give us an idea of where MITCO stands now in terms of um, its uh, sustainability as, as a business, um, uh, income versus expenditure, how does your bank account look like? Thank, thank you so much. Uh, look, uh, coming from the environment where we came from, where you had the drought, you had COVID-19, you had an intensification of disease outbreaks uh, that affected the, the business. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, at, at this stage, I think uh, the going concern earlier on as per our strategic intent was really to reduce the debt. Mm -hmm. uh, we have dealt with that. Currently, uh, profitability and sustainability is what is important for us moving so forward. Mm. So what we are basically doing, we are glad that government has injected uh, the capital they did. I think that was a strategic intervention and we are appreciative. It has stabilized the institution in terms of its uh, finances. Critical to us now is to make sure that we optimize the throughput into the abattoir. Mm. Uh, at the same time, we build dynamic capabilities in terms of our operational efficiencies, and then we maximize retains from the market. Mm. Uh, and also, uh, we made sure that we created a more leaner midco mm. so that the fixed costs are reduced, and we have done extremely very well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, most of the outsourced services that the institution was doing, we also internalized them. Mm. I think that helps us a lot to cut down on the fixed costs so that when we get the revenue, we are better off to have a more manageable and the, you know, a healthier business. Mm. So um, it has been challenging, no doubt about that, extremely challenging, but we are glad with the current intervention that Midcoast future is brighter and we are able to move forward. We received very good rain uh, the past two years. Mm. Farmers have restocked, I mean, have, have restocked. If you look at the Ketu numbers, they look good and the quality coming into the abattoir. Mm. So all the indicators currently, they really show that we do have much brighter days ahead of us and we'll keep on pressing on that button. Indeed. Come and see you. It was a pleasure thank really you. having you on the platform. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That is uh, Mulima Mushoka Banji, he's uh, the CEO of Mitco, just filling us in on uh, the operations and uh, potential of the company. Thank you for watching. NMH at One brings you news from all across Namibia. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact NMH1 at synergy.com.na. NMH at One, your lunchtime news companion. The Noorlilag publication focuses on the central northern regions of Namibia, highlighting the activities that have an impact on locals as well as the role players in economic and social upliftment. The Noorlilag is inserted in the Republican and distributed countrywide. The Noorlilag provides the ideal opportunity to communicate with our readers on what your business has to offer not just for locals, but for tourists and locals visiting the central northern area of Namibia. Providing a wonderful opportunity and platform to enhance your brand, contact republicane at synergy.com.na. The Agenda is a weekly national affairs interview program hosted every Sunday by Namibian Sun editor Trayvon Javela, featuring a panel of high-profile newsmakers, analysts and experts. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact agenda at synergy.com.na. The Agenda, focus on today's conversation. The Evening Review is a daily interview-based talk show that dissects and expounds on current affairs as they occur in Namibia. 
The show aims at reaching Namibians of all age groups who seek better understanding of the state of current affairs in the country. This show is broadcasted on NTV, OneUp2.com and cross-shared on the following Facebook platforms, Namibian Sun and Namibia Media Holdings. The Evening Review focuses on interviews, latest news and up-to-the-minute current events. Contact evening at synergy.com.na Evening Review Unpacking today's pertinent issues. Africa Good Morning is a current affairs program that brings you the latest from Southern Africa and beyond. News, economics, sport, weather, interviews, and so much more. For any advertising or news related queries, contact AGM at synergy.com.na. Africa Good Morning, bringing Africa to you. Three, two, one. Here we, go. we Talk brings you community news that lies at the heart of Vindic residents. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact We Talk at synergy.com.na. You live, we talk. Namibia's hospitality is as vibrant as its people. Join the Watts cooking team as they travel the country cooking, chatting, and celebrating local personalities and the joy of food. If you think you have a standout offering, whether it's a restaurant, bar, pop-up event, or bry stand, get in touch with the Watts Cooking Team at cooking at synergy.com.na and we will be there to show the world what's cooking. Programs air every Friday at 4 p.m. on all the NMH Facebook platforms, as well as on NTV, DSTV Channel 285, and Go TV Channel 94 at 9 p.m. With the focus on mind, body, and soul, the medical focus aims to embrace that which makes us human, to empower, enlighten, and bring hope in restoring the equilibrium to be the best that we can be, to bring change where change is needed, to inspire to be better, and to restore that which is out of balance. Find the much-anticipated medical focus, which will be published in the Republican, Namibian Sun, and Algemeine Zeitung, and the glossy magazines which will be distributed to selected retail outlets, subscribers and advertising partners. NMH Ad 1 brings you news from all across Namibia. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact NMH1 at synergy.com.na. NMH at 1, your lunchtime news companion. The Evening Review is a daily interview-based talk show that dissects and expounds on current affairs as they occur in Namibia. The show aims at reaching Namibians of all age groups who seek better understanding of the state of current affairs in the country. This show is broadcasted on NTV, OneUp2.com and cross-shared on the following Facebook platforms, Namibian Sun and Namibia Media Holdings. The Evening Review focuses on interviews, latest news and up-to-the-minute current events. Contact evening at synergy.com.na Evening Review 
unpacking today's pertinent issues. The Agenda is a weekly national affairs interview program hosted every Sunday by Namibian Sun editor Toivon Jabela, featuring a panel of high-profile newsmakers, analysts and experts. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact agenda at synergy.com.na. The Agenda, focused on today's conversations.